I'm Johan Rashivega, and here we are in the sound room of Holyoke Media, One Core Plus in Holyoke, Massachusetts. And we are gathered here to talk about side effects. Side effects, too. We are talking the combination of awareness and also awareness through art, which is possibly one of the most beautiful and reactive and deep ways to connect in order to send a message and inform and educate people. And I want to thank and welcome three of the artists who are part of this exhibit, Side Effects 2. I want to welcome uh, Lynn Horan, Amy Youngquest, and Ism Prism, Orlando Santos. <laughs> yeah. Welcome, thank you for being here. <laughs> Glad to be here. So, Side Effects 2. There is a concept behind this, and as we can see in the poster, we see uh, what it will be a container of some sort of medication or a concoction mm -hmm. intended to help solve some health issues or ailments. So. There is a strong connection between the art and the side effects of it. So please let us know all about it. Well, um, if you guys don't mind, I'll start. My I'm Lynn Horan, and um, I'm curating this show um, as well as participating in it. Um, side effects was actually an idea that uh, a Holyoke artist at the time um, Bruce Fowler and myself came up with almost nine years ago, we had that show in Holyoke with the idea and the sideline of side effects is when the mind makes b promises the body can't fill. A quote from an old Lowell, um, uh, actually Little Feet song many years ago, but the premise on side effects really is that we have wonderful hopes and dreams and aspirations. Sometimes we agree on them, sometimes we don't, but they're all based in the vessel of our physical body and bodies are not permanent. Um, so that's kind of the impact um, of side effects, that it expands not only the impermanence of body, but our emphasis on how we look, our uh, unfortunate, sometimes hyper-focus on eternal youth. Um, society gets to dictate what color your skin is in terms of preference, what your gender of your body is. Um, it comes into all our lives, um, as removed as we may be from our biology right now. Um, it, it is still the vessel that holds us all. And so side effects, this particular show, we see as something still relevant. We just had a pandemic, as everybody knows. That certainly shut life down globally. Um, when bodies fail, viruses come in, um, it's undeniable its impact. We have the largest aging group of people in the boomers we've ever had right now. Um, so what disabled people like myself like to call the temporarily abled because eventually aging and bodies um, deteriorate to a point as well. Um, so there's all sorts of issues, the failing healthcare system that, that is more um, benefiting a few for profit, uh, profit as opposed to healing. Um, there's just a multitude of issues here, and of course we can wind up with right now in 2024 and think there's AI coming in. Will we actually eventually evolve out of our bodies one day? So that's kind of the basic background of side effects. And then as Johan very put it quite well, um, the artists involved in this show, some of them were in the first one, some are new to it, 
but all of them have a commonality of understanding vulnerabilities in the body and dealing with what life gives you and finding that yes, art has great healing properties and artists are the great translators of all these things. So that's what you'll see when you come here is 11 artists with varied approaches to all of these issues. And for what I see in this list of artists, we have a quite diverse selection and gathering of artists who have been around in the Holyoke and the region in the Valley mm -hmm. for, for quite a while, active artists. And I would like to know about how bringing this second iteration of side effects in these times when we are trying to get the, the pandemic behind us and realizing all the changes and all the adjustments that need to be made in the system for health and for awareness on disabilities. How does this work for one of the items of inspiration for this exhibit? Shall I? Yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the piece I'm working on right now is uh, based on a piece I had in the first show, which was called Miracle Pill. And it was a large banner that had this giant pill, and then it listed ad infinitum uh, all the side effects that might come with taking this miracle pill, which cures everything. Um, for me, the bottom line to getting through just about anything on this planet is to keep your sense of humor. And so the the piece I did is it's bright, it's fun, it's colorful, and it's humorous, but it is based on a reality that's tough, a tough pill to swallow <laughs> um, in that uh, the, the cure that you're taking might actually be causing you more problems on the side effects. So... Um, there is that, but uh, um, I'm taking that piece that I did the first show, and I've uh, made three gicle prints out of it, and I'm altering them with painting over the top of the prints, and um, we'll see what happens. I'm still working on them. And Orlando, uh, what can you share with us about uh, your your take on the inspiration for side effects too? Um. I don't know. I, I think inspiration is, is all around. Um, as in for um, something that um, Amy said. Um, like, like like with me, I I um I hide a lot of the sad sadder things or or you know behind bright colors. Um, I use bright colors to um like this one right here that I got this painting right here. That's like um like revolutionist of, of, of a struggle, you know, with Harriet Tubman and, and Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. And you can't see them back there, but I use bright colors to kind of like hide behind um, things that are happening today and stuff like that. Where, the, you know, and a lot of times people will see them and be like, well, that happened years ago, but it's happening today still to this day. You know, you see the struggles with racism and, and, and you know, all, all types of, you know, things along, along that, um, those you know those topics yeah I'm kind of just like <laughs> out there right now so there's definitely racism in the medical well yeah yes institutions as well you, and how you, you well see, you see, you see all of that in, in um even like well healthcare system and mm -hmm. and um how like someone will get better health care than someone else mm -hmm. you know and it, it's all money in the end you know what I mean <laughs> Absolutely. Access is, is, or lack of, is definitely a big part of it. And also treatment. Um, <laughs> people of color have, uh, women have more um, childbirth issues than anyone else in America. Um, higher mortality high, in this day and mortality. age, 2024. And again, these differences are not anatomical. Um, I know that uh, I've had MS for 38 years, been in a wheelchair 
for a number of years. And when you look at the statistics for disabled people, for instance, um, we're the largest marginalized group in the world, according to the World Health Organization, but we're also the most diverse, which the good news is that makes us an interesting, should make us a powerful group of people. But the fact is, if you are black, Latino, uh, indigenous American, you are more likely to become disabled. And again, it has nothing to do with anatomy. It is a form of discrimination and access to proper health care. So, um, yeah, it's definitely all there. The side effects of living, the side effects of perceptions of bodies. Um, all of those things. And I like Amy's pieces, uh, particularly because she does bring humor into it in the whole big pharma situation. I like to think of it uh, years ago, I'm in my 60s, when I was growing up, all the television advertisements talk about art being misused in marketing, but all kind of fun to watch too. Um, so we're marketing our own philosophies here, but um, most of the <laughs> televisions, so you gotta get with it kids, right? So um, most of the television commercials were cars and liquor. <laughs> and now when you look at television, there are still car commercials, but it's mostly drugs. It really mm -hmm. is. It, it really, really is. is. It really and is. again, it's brand new as, ones all the time. Yep, yeah, it is it's all the time wow. for anything and everything, making it look like you're jumping into the pool and having a grand time. Yeah. If you take this drug, meanwhile, as Amy lists in her work, there is a uh, risk of death, risk of psychological impairment, risk of all sorts of things. So um, it is the irony and the disaster of our health care system, that's for sure. And again, Orlando, I love to, um, and Amy as well, knowing um, Orlando for less time, but watching this very prolific artist, because I think most art is autobiographical, and the way that he works, I feel like through his work, I've already begun to get good insights into him even outside of our, our talks. Uh, Amy, I've known longer, but both, you know, it is a place to heal, it's a place to go. We live in really, really chaotic times yeah. now. Yeah, we'll let it go. I think art is very healing without it. Um, <laughs> I don't know where I would be personally. I know that, um, it was kind of like a trade-off for me with um, with alcohol, you know, dealing with alcoholism and stuff like that. Um, like three and a half, four years into recovery, I um, I started doing this, and it just it took off, you know. And um, been very fortunate about that. <clears throat> and um, I, I remember I was asking a friend of mine, like, um, "Do you think if I didn't find art, do you think I probably would have relapsed?" He said, "Absolutely. The way you are, like, you know, you're, you're just all over the place, real." Um, very active person and all over the place and this is this is a place to go to for me like it really is I mean I should have brought one of my other paintings it's called um, Relapse and and it's a, about that like where I wanted to go out and, and try again or whatnot and then I just got into my art and it just brought me right back to, to reality <laughs> you know it's, it's as funny as it sounds because art is almost like you know imaginary sometimes you know you be you're, you're you know you're out there like in space or whatever and then it really is like my reality you know what I mean? <clears throat> when, I, when I do it it feel like a safe space I'm, I'm good I'm, I'm, I'm whole Absolutely. And, and if I didn't have it then I don't even know where I'd be you know without art yeah. I'd probably be dead honestly Congratulations on your sobriety. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. I'm gonna have nice. nine years um, in June. June. Fantastic. That's remarkable. I never, I never thought I would ever even get this yeah. far, but this has yeah. a lot to do with yeah. you know me getting to where it I'm at. does. Yeah. It does. Healing. I have a loved one going through recovery as well, and music is a is a That's huge part of absolutely. it for him, and always has been a thread there too. And again, that's another side effect of our our current society too is is that we really need to pick up on mental health care we know there's mm. an increase even before the pandemic 
of people needing therapy and health care and options as opposed to what we typically might take with alcohol, drugs, whatever, mm -hmm. um, and trying to deal with difficult circumstance, not always of our own choice, by the way, either. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's a huge deal. And in the same, in the meantime, um, again, uh, you can see both Amy and Orlando's work coming up in June, live and in person, um, and talk to them as well. And I also want to mention, Amy's just pointing to the poster again, which reminds me one of our participating artists also designed our fabulous poster, Rob Kimmel from Florence, so we're really glad yes. to, to have him on board for that to help. We love our poster. Yes, we <laughs> do. And they're keeper, collector posters, by the way, too. Seeing how in your own words and experiences, art is not only the way to send a message and to create awareness, it has also been your own personal way to cope to with Absolutely. side effects also. and with uh, main sources of, of a disability or a well, condition. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. how strong, how powerful art can be to keep our lives going on and to give us purpose and to give us Just goals. What do you feel it will be the best experience the public can have by coming and seeing this exhibit and having the opportunity of enjoying learning about the stories behind each piece of side effects too? I'll leave that to Lynn. Well, uh, for starters, I'm just thinking as you're talking, because I'm a teacher as well, um, I went to a Faith Ringhold, uh, who just passed away, sadly, wonderful, well-known American uh, black artist, um, had an exhibit recently. And the most interesting part to me was not just her work, but looking in the sign-in books, a very smart teacher had brought a group of high school students in, and their commentary was fascinating to hear what our young people were talking about. They're worrying about Gaza, they're worrying um, about gender discrimination, they're worrying about racial discrimination, they're worrying about war, they're worrying about what's happening in this country. and. So I would say that um, hopefully that's, that's the thing about coming to a show like this, that there's a lot of meat here. Um, yes, absolutely come to the opening because that's your greatest chance of meeting the artist. We will also have a panel discussion on um, arts and, and accessibility um, with one of a state person from, from Open Door Arts will be joining us, Megan Bent, um, who has done an evaluation on institutions and galleries, theaters, and various um, arts venues, and how we can do better to make them accessible. Um, and so that's part of this. This show is also a show to definitely bring students in, I would say. Bring kids in, share them, hear what they have to say. Um, the show will be up from June 8th to June 28th, so lots of times, kids out of school. Um, these are serious subjects. Mm. Um, they really are, and I think sometimes we underestimate what our children are scared of right now True. and how they really need to talk about it. And sometimes going to a visual art show or a music performance is the best way to find out what they're thinking. Yeah, you'd be surprised um, how, how relatable stuff like this, like, like a show like that. And it'll be someone from a different walk of life, different, um, uh, race or whatnot, but how relatable the art is. Like you know, like I got this one piece of art where where I'm like on the ground, like drunk. You know, I wish I would have brought that one. And it's like you know, and and it's like you know, it's like how many people haven't gone through that, like the feeling of that and whatnot. How relatable it is too, and and also how like mental health. Um, like um, Lynn was saying earlier, it's kind of like um because we don't know what our issue is. We don't even realize that we have a mental issue. Let's say, for example, um, we turn around to drugs and alcohol and whatnot, and there's really some other way of really coping with it, understand, understanding what's going on with yeah. you, 
will help you to propel forward in, in, in life and, and go about things the right way. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like I use this like honestly like a drug. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm doing art, but it's just like and it's like like people walk in my studio like you have so much art, but I'm like think like I used to drink a lot. <laughs> so it's kinda like, you know, it, it's a lot of stuff that's very relatable to whoever comes to see that show. I, I know that they're gonna see like, wow, like this is another part of me and, and you know, and we all have that commonality, you know, when like, we all go through things that we don't realize sometimes we trap ourselves and think we're the only ones and there's other people you can actually reach out to yeah. and, and um, come out of that hole or that place that you, you don't feel good in it. And, and there's so I'm, much, you're right, there's so much stigma attached to illness, to mental health issues, etc. Mm-hmm. So it's a tremendous thing that Orlando is doing and you'll see that from other artists in the show also have their own physical and other um, vulnerabilities that when we can kind of open that door a little bit um, the conversations that happen are wonderful they were great in the first time we did this show um, to be able to reach people so it is it is us able to express ourselves and what we're feeling, which is great, in a constructive way, but it is also opening the door and allowing it others to do the same thing. And there's really nothing like that, that positive power. Mm. If I could add, um, this is sort of on the side, but related, that um, in curriculums, reading, writing, you know, arithmetic. Um, when the arts are applied to regular teaching curriculums, the retention goes up 80%. Mm-hmm. And it's just not really done yet. It's starting to weave in, but it, it's, uh, it's so powerful that it just speaks to the power of educating through art and mm-hmm. not, it's not beating someone over the head with repetition and you know a uh, grueling demanding thing it's a creative soulful experience and even to look at art that offers you the same kind of context I think. And that's so true because no person no child has difficulty learning for the same reason and all of us learn um, in different ways and manners you know so absolutely and again, it doesn't always have to be in the traditional classroom either. You know, take your kids out for performances and art shows. Mm-hmm. You were mentioning, Lynn, that uh, as well as part of creating art and having this work and the awareness that uh, Side Effects 2 is bringing, it is important to also have spaces that are adequate for accessibility and for all the possible ways to people to enjoy and experience art and experience activities and gathering in ways that adapt and meet the needs of of people. I am curious uh, to know about the New England Ambition Visionary Artist Museum because when when I saw that um, the event is taking place in Northampton, Usually we think of the common places where things happen. And seeing that is the New England Missionary Artist Museum makes me wonder how this place became the hub for this exhibit. So um, Michael Tillier uh, and his uh, wife, Susan, have been working with artists for over three decades, my understanding. and. Um, in various forms, and particularly um, artists that aren't necessarily your traditional artists um, who come about it or come to it in different ways and often do battle uh, everything from mental health issues to all sorts of other um, issues. Um, So that seemed um, like a good sort of um, good growing sort of place for it to happen. And uh, quite frankly, it was one of the few galleries um, that I in a wheelchair can, as a curator or artist, can get into, let alone other artists. And, um, And 
we had we had had one in Holyoke at that time I was walking with a crutch it was still difficult to get into but it is definitely um, there is no uh, large enough for a show like this art space sadly in Holyoke or in a lot of places frankly spaces in general yes and, and you know, artists premium. have, frankly, a hard time finding visual artist space. You can even find more theaters um, than you can visual galleries, um, even uh, by our local cultural arts institutions. They, they tend to be smaller spaces and highly, highly competitive because there's so many more visual artists than there are spaces anywhere, as yeah. Amy said around and then accessibility is almost so one of the things we'll be talking about too on the panel discussion is there is an act before Massachusetts state legislation called the ACE Act right now um, and it is um, together the Massachusetts Cultural Arts Organization along with Open Door Arts which um, um, has used to be called very special arts part of the kennedy organization many years ago for disabled artists have combined and at the d december at the very end of 2022 they did a spectacular evaluation of all the museums and theaters and galleries around the state of massachusetts and how accessible they <coughs> were in the various needs for artists with disabilities um, and it was interesting because one of the findings, um, and it's something you can um, look up in Google under Open Door Arts, we'll have that um, evaluation. The outcome was that most of these institutions really did sincerely believe it was important um, to have accessibility for all types of dis disabled artists, musicians and audience, um, but there was a real big gap between that and the amount of institutions that it also made their, their institutions or galleries accessible. We know, of course, there's tremendous expense if it's a historic building, elevators, as they certainly know at Holyoke Media here, et cetera, but it can be done. And I can't tell you how many times I see great fundraising happening in an arts facility um, and then lots of the money goes to more decorative stuff or they they do seem to think they have the intention of being accessible but what happens is somehow it's still kind of treated as a luxury and I like to remind people when I testified for that hearing too that when you are a disabled person you may be an artist, you might be a musician who's disabled. Um, one of uh, our panelists will be Jeremy McComber Dubbs, who is a known local musician here, also uses a wheelchair. Um, and he's had issues with trying to get up on a stage. Um, frankly, able-bodied musicians have trouble lugging their amps and everything and all the equipment on a stage. So to have an elevator, to have a ramp, um, really is a universal design element that would benefit everybody. Mm. If we really start changing our mentality about that. And the final thing I would say, um, as a disabled person, since I was 27 raising two children, I couldn't go to a lot of functions. I couldn't take my kids to functions. Um, and that was horrible. Birthday parties at events and places where I couldn't get in, you know, Fourth of July events, um, all, all sorts of things. And with the wheelchair, of course, that's just um, magnified tremendously um, to try to be able to go in to um, these kind of institutions. So when you have inaccessibility, you're not only closing out the artists and musicians, you are closing out families. You know, and I, I also give the, you know, I have friends with children in wheelchairs and the parents have to really work hard 
to maintain a balance of equanimity with how they treat the healthy, so-called healthy children with the disabled ones. And there can be a lot of resentment if the healthy child can't go to an event because the disabled child can't get in. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so thanks for asking. It's, 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 a, it's a huge issue. Um, and I'm really glad to see the state starting to really address it, but it's going to take a lot of work to convince the legislation from all of you people out there. So. But definitely having uh, something like side effects too is one of many ways that collectively we can participate, being involved, learn, educate ourselves, and at the same time, push for that legislation and for those changes to happen, not only on the legislative side, but also in the society, in the community, to be more aware and more proactive on acknowledging disabilities and to be supportive of the needs that come with it. Because as you mentioned, it's not a luxury. It's, it's a not. right, and it's, it's important that we that we uh, look out for our our people in our community, especially our, our people with disabilities. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would add to that too. I talk a lot about uh, mobility, accessibility, but there's all sorts of disabilities. Um, there's intellectual ones. There's um, uh, on the spectrum issues, there are hearing impaired mm -hmm. folks, there are vision impaired folks. Um, again, this is all part of why we're such a large group. It's, it's kind of almost unfathomable when you think about it that we haven't tapped into this more. And we tend to be some of the most resourceful people you can think of. Um, you know, uh, it, because we've had to learn to yeah, adapt. adapt. And, and I know for me anyway, and each of us is different, that, um, that I had to develop a very strong personality. I wanted people to see me first um, and accept me as lover, partner, friend, employee um, first, and then see, oh yeah, okay, but she does have these things, but we can work with that. Um, and it's, it's very, because of that, um, we learn, we find ways, you know, if we can't get what we want with plan A, there's 25 other letters, plans in the alphabet to go down the line in. So we have that resourcefulness and that strength that can, can be hopefully a benefit to others as well. And again, there are all sorts of disabilities, again, OCD, ADD. Uh, there's all sorts of things that are invisible, I guess, is what I want to say as well. So, yeah, but in, in the process, I think when people come to this show, they will see artists that participated who have a lot of these things that they're dealing with all their lives, and they may or may not talk about it but it will be there in their work. I think too, just a participant that comes to the show, a person that comes to see the show is also just going to see a really cool show. Yeah. You know, even if they don't get all of the intricacies and the depth and the, you know, politics, any of it, even if they don't get any of it, they're gonna love this show. It's going to be really visually appealing. Yeah. Um, there's uh, the, uh, the artists that are involved are all equally amazing and wonderful and as a integral scene I can tell you the first show was fantastic and this show is going to be just as great if not greater I agree yep it's just exciting. walking in the rooms yeah I'm, okay. I'm grateful to be a part of it no doubt without a doubt I'm grateful Absolutely. to be here too Absolutely. <laughs> This is the type of projects that have the beauty of not only being a gathering of artists and displaying their work. On top of that, we have the strong power of art and creative union of, of, of forces and inspiration Human towards the goal of creating this awareness and send this message mm -hmm. about yeah. acknowledging, supporting, and doing something that takes care of health, Disability. It's an umbrella, definitely. 
this yeah, is absolutely. a beautiful mission, a beautiful work, and I couldn't be more more happy to know that this is happening. So I'm really thankful for Thank all this effort to make it possible. The uh, the opening night is the ninth. The f- uh, the opening is the fourteenth, which oh, the 14th. will to know. <laughs> Friday okay. of June, and and that coincides the, with <clears throat> excuse me. Arts Night Out in Northampton, fourteenth of June, mm-hmm. and um, and the the panel discussion on disability in the arts will happen the following Thursday on the twentieth. And again, you can call the gallery um, for more information on their daily hours and when. So you can come. Certainly, would love for you to come when the artists are there for the opening, but it it will be available to be seen by the public all through June till the twenty eighth as well. June eighth through twenty eighth, so essentially, almost the whole month of June. This is at the New England Visionary Artist Museum in five eighteen Pleasant Street in Northampton, featuring eleven artists from the region here in the valley and a really important message in it about being aware of health, the health system, the health industry, but also to tackle down the stigma and sometimes the chosen ignorance related to disability. We need to make sure that we open up our minds and joy of the art, but at the same time that we leave with something that we can utilize to support our community. Well put. Yes, and thank you, Johan. Thank you. Thank Johann. you. Holyoke Media is a huge gift to all the arts mm-hmm. and our culture here in Holyoke. It is part, of the, it is part of the whole thing.